Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this latest uh, iteration of the Indica Books Open House with Otis. Uh, as you know, and uh, earlier in the day, we also had the launch event for the Indica Books Thousand Reviewers Club 2022 edition, where I talked about uh, this program and how people can use this to become better writers, better reviewers, uh, and in general, improve their writing. So for those of you who end up watching this uh, when it is put up on YouTube, this is how it works. We invite people, as I said, again, who want to improve their writing, get feedback on the writing to submit 800 word pieces to Otis and uh, he sends his uh, feedback to you marked up in the PDF that you send him. And then when we meet on Sunday, uh, we all spend time reviewing the piece. I mean, Otis reviews the piece, he gives us feedback and all, and we invite everyone who joins in to ask questions to go through the piece as it is shared on the screen and uh, in general, become better writers. Uh, with that, I will turn this over to you, Otis. Okay, um, and you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, I, I like that in general, become better writers. That's, that's a good <laughs> aspiration. That's a good aspiration. It's a crutch it, word uh, of mine, I think, in general. You know, it's one of my many, many, many crutch words. <laughs> my daughters, my daughters, for some reason, always say, sadly, <laughs> that this seems to be very popular now. It's like, sadly, I'm, I won't be able to do blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I don't know, does it happen? Yeah, imagine someone saying, you know, sadly, your execution has been stayed. <laughs> yeah, right. Sadly. Uh, they're also, what, what are they? Um, no offense, you know, before they say something offensive. No offense, dad but you really should change your clothes. No offense, but your child looks uh, like it could make a mother scream. No offense, sadly. <laughs> no, no offense, but um, um, let's see. So uh, Ram, let's, um, let's, uh, let's reconnect with you, my friend. It's been a long time. Writing is a long process. Um, I think you sent me, I had three works of yours and I actually just reviewed them this morning. And I think um, two of them were the Sitta uh, pieces yeah. and we talked about one of those. And I don't yeah. think we talked about the second one. No, we haven't. I also noticed, I noticed today that I have not read it. So somehow I did not read that one for the, the way before the one we did it. And I don't have any marks on it now, but I might imagine that that maybe our comments on Sitta one would affect number two, right? So oh, no, actually you had sent me comments okay. on that. You had sent me comments on the concluding piece also. You had sent it last week. Really? Um, yeah. How about the how about the piece the how about the short play that you started? Did we talk about that? We haven't spoken about it, but you did send me feedback about that two page thing also, which I had written, or uh, like in reaction to the Ukraine crisis. You had sent me feedback right. on that as well. Right. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, let's just talk about that one. I mean, you 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 wrote that piece. If is, if that's all right, would you like to talk about that one? Yeah, hey, absolutely. Bit? Okay, absolutely. Um, it's uh, it's nicely short, and I'd like to make a couple comments on it, and um, and then we can, you know, we'll move on. Okay, so let's yeah, see. Let I me share it. my screen. And then, uh, and then we have uh, Rashma also from last week, and we'll talk about that. And then, um, uh. Uh, Sri Charan and then Ashvami. So that, that'll be, I think, our order for today. Um, sure. Okay, you see your piece here? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think it's short enough. Why don't, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just that, that much. So why don't- it's, I think it's just all? two pages. It's less than two pages. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's hear the whole thing. All right, so let me just open it. I'll just open my copy and read it from there. Okay. okay. Uh, this is titled Honor, Duty Before Self, Really. Countries fight wars for honor. 
what does a soldier fight wars for pogo pushes into place the army issue beret that is slipping off his colleague gogo's head he spits a gob of dirt kicked up by the boots of the soldiers bustling about that has gathered in his throat his eyebrows arch up at the supreme leader's fiery speech blaring over the loudspeakers arise soldiers of the motherland guardians of our mother's honor keepers of peace and saviors of civilization arise this is the opportunity that you have been waiting for prove to the enemy that the soil into which your fathers spilled their blood and sweat has given birth to sons so brave that the enemy will cover in fright go forth fight fight for your country for your motherland for your mother for your wives and sisters fight for your children fight for honor pogo turns to gogo pogo bhai do you think we are fighting for the right cause gogo picking his ear hey pogo are do you agree with the cause gogo still picking his ear will they issue new boots and blankets before we leave for the front pogo really that's what you want to know gogo i hear waha pe it's cold pogo so gogo wiggles toe through torn shoe upper so they will issue it today pogo seriously you can't be gogo looks up smiling chamki is getting married i'll smuggle out the new boots for the dulha pogo like you did last year gogo no no that was for bauji the blanket i'll send for amma gogo hey the government pays your salary to fight not to ship off kit to your mom and dad gogo will they pay the salary in advance i'm also saying the roof is leaking and needs to be repaired okay thank you um yeah there there's a couple things that that i wanted to talk about i you, you know i um i'm i'm also principally writing about a war it was a war and it was a desert storm war in you know 1990 now um okay and it it's interesting i i sort of wanted you know like hearing hearing this piece i was wondering like how how did you what was it like to write a piece sort of that was in a response to a current event you know what 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 did you feel in that oh uh so i have i have a few friends who have been in the services and uh, normally what happens in the media and in a lot of literature is that uh, things like uh, being in the services it is it is it's uh, it's very romanticized i'm sure there is, absolutely there is no doubt that uh, it it's there are higher objectives higher ideals in that but behind all of that i think there lurks a human being and i have a few friends who have been in the services when i speak with them i do hear those stories from them like uh, and and when i wrote that uh, about one of those soldiers saying that uh, the parents house had a leaking roof this is something that i remember from the interview of a soldier who was martyred they interviewed his parents over in a village and the only thing that the father said is i was hoping for my son's salary to come so that i could repair the roof and that stayed with me so uh, yeah. behind behind the soldiers people say that uh, and i had once met an ex serviceman who was a major in the army and he asked a question why do soldiers fight do they fight for their country i mean is it patriotism absolutely there is patriotism but a soldier is probably as patriotic as anybody else maybe uh, as you and me does he fight for the salary we all know that the pay in the services is not that great uh, so he said the soldier in the army fights for his unit the unit comes first for him he doesn't let give up on his unit that's what he fights for which is why leadership is so important on the front so uh, until then i used to have a lot of this you know uh, ideals about the services where i used to think various things uh, i was a young youngster then then when this uh, ukraine crisis developed it is soldiers fighting on either side who's right who's wrong does it matter to them does it really matter to them that who is right who is wrong are they fighting for the cause or right, what are the right. yeah so there I, were a lot of this lot of this thoughts that came up and i just wrote this on impulse okay i um i was i was trying to steer you a little bit into you know something you know that that i i think about some and occurs to me with your piece is that you know if we if we look at the outside world and we see you know the what we could call it, the news you know i mean we see these events that really affect us and 
And, and the thing that happens is, you know, when we, when we learn about these events, we feel a sense of survival threat ourselves. You know, we, we internalize uh, what's going on and it increases our anxiety. And, and um, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, in the world today, we can, we can have a lot of anxiety about global warming and, you know, weather situations and, you know, warfare. And, <laughs> you start talking about nuclear weapons and then, you know, we, we have these panics. Um, but I guess one thing that, that I, that I just sort of wanted to comment on, you know, for all of us as, as writers is that I find that when I'm writing about things, it requires a kind of shift for me from mm. an attention to the outside world. And then there's a shift kind of to this other world, even though I might be writing about things that are of issue and germane to this outside world, there's still this sort of different space that I go into to write about this world. And the space that I enter in when I'm in this world is one that is, um, that is emotional, but it's also essentially calm too. you know, I, it ends up being a kind of sanctuary, you know, I mean, even though I'm writing about things that are very difficult, it ends up being something of a sanctuary space, than my engagement with the world sort of me and the world. Does that does that make any sense? It's like, that that's sort of what I wanted to kind okay. of bring up like the, in a way, the sort of personal the personal benefit that we get when we engage in this sort of imaginative activity where we're writing the characters. And I think one of the differences is that we end up being this person up here who's, a, you know, we're sort of the writer or the director or the composer who's considering life. And that allows us this sort of elevation above the the sort of the engaged body, you know, the person who's involved with what's going on specifically, and that maybe that's the kind of transition that we end up finding when we write that has a kind of, it's not exactly cathartic quality, but it, it, it helps us, I guess, it helps us deal with, you know, some of these issues, like maybe any art does. I guess that's what I was trying to lean towards a little bit. Okay. No, I, I don't know if I went through any of those processes consciously, but this was more like a thought that was triggered by something that was happening out in the world. And this this was an impulse. It, I, I, I actually wrote this on impulse and I didn't even edit it. Well, I, I, I guess I, I, in the big, in the big picture, I guess I'm saying I appreciate your impulse and, and um, I sort of, I guess I wanted to use your piece to comment on it, maybe just for everyone that, that I think, you know, writing allows us this sort of, I don't know, a, li a little bit of this sort of sanctuary space and, and it's kind of can be helpful, you know, and then we're also producing something. So we feel like we're doing something that has some utility too. It's not just, you know, spinning our wheels. So anyway, so I appreciated it. Um, Thank you. I think um, I think another thing that you that you said that I think is worth maybe commenting on. I think that it's great. You know, you were talking about people that you know in the in the um, military and things that they've said, and and you've taken those things to inform you. Um, I think you want to take things in as a as a writer. You want to take things in um, sort of maximally, but you also want to recognize that when you're hearing what people say, you're also hearing what they say, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? True. Like, True. you're, True. you know, like when we when we think about characters, remember what we say, when we think about characters, what we say are actions, and they're actions for a purpose, right? They do something for us, right? The things we say, they're actions, just like if we take an apple and we bite it, it's the same thing as we say something we're doing it for a reason yeah. so I, I think it i think it's good we definitely want to listen and we also as writers we want to appreciate from here 
that we're also hearing an action um, and that that human need to sort of explain ourselves, no matter how we explain ourselves, even if it goes contrary to, let's say, yes, there's the public, there's this public proclamation of like honor and all of this, right? So we hear that in your piece, you know, with the Supreme Leader, right? Um, we have this sort of public, a public story. And then we, but we also have this private story and it's also a story, right? It's a story that we're telling right. ourselves about ourselves. And I think one thing that we take away or that we should understand as writers is that this is one of the human compulsions that we have is to try and tell our story, to try and find some kind of place and locality, you know, through what we think and believe about ourselves. Um, it's a, that becomes a pretty profound place to be, but I'm, I guess I would encourage you. I think you're, we already do it automatically as writers, I think. Um, but I want to encourage you to, to have control over your material. Okay. Even though you might feel like, well, I'm not in the military. Maybe I can't write, you know, these military characters. I'm going to suggest you can because there's a larger, more universal story above that for everybody. Um, issues of identity, uh, issues of um, feeling good about ourselves and what we do in the world. Um, issues of having a purpose. Anyway, there's a lot of issues. And so I'm just encouraging you to, to, to remember that we're at the end of the day, we're we're after something even bigger. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't mean bigger because it's not. I don't want it to be better in any way. But we're after something else. We're after something even more universal mm -hmm. than than the individuated experience that people are that that people are experiencing. Because we're using a cast of characters, all with individual experiences in order to get to uh, to get to an examination of the human condition and the human condition is something that's shared by everybody. So, but I think you're on the, I think you're on the right track. And I wanted to say that things I really liked in this piece, I love um, the Pogo and Gogo -Go seem a little bit com, you know, a little uh, like comic, to me, um, it's is it Pogo and Gogo? Are they also the ones in um, Waiting for Godot? It sounds like it's like has a Waiting for Godot type feeling to it. Um, actually, so. actually, there's a reason why I put them as Pogo and Gogo because uh, I didn't want the names to indicate anything like you know ethnicity or you know or religion or anything like that. So I just and, came up with these two random names and they rhymed with each other and that's the reason. Because any anything else, the moment I use a name, then it is associated with a demographic uh, uh, region, either a place or a religion or a caste or anything. So I wanted to keep it independent of that, because then our conditioning is such that we start applying color to it. Interesting. Well, that's so that's a that's a case of Indian names. They 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 come with all of that sort of meta information. Yeah, I think I think that happens not only in India, but even elsewhere. I mean, if I use, for example, had this been uh, set in, let us say, Ukraine or Russia or the Baltics, and I used a Muslim name and a Christian name, uh, immediately we start to attach meanings based on our conditioning and what what stimulus we have received from the media and from the world at large. So I wanted this to be independent of that. Yeah, OK, an interesting, an interesting problem. Yeah. An interesting problem. So, which is why even even though there is a mention of a wedding, uh, the fact that he wants to gift uh, shoes to the uh, to the groom that happens across communities in India. It's not not specific to any one religion. So, mm -hmm. which is why I tried very hard to keep it independent. Well, it, it it brings up a it brings up a really interesting issue. I mean, because so. You know, like just what I was saying that we're going for something that's sort of universal in terms of what we're writing about in story, um, but that the characters, of course, are expressing their individuality. Yeah. Do we think that yeah. the characters themselves 
can somehow be removed from their individual circumstances. And if we do remove them from their individual circumstances, do they become generic? Because we're, yeah. what we're, I, I mean, I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm speculating, I'm, uh, this is, to me, it's an amazing conversation. I love thinking about stuff like this, but like, right. since our job is to go to the universal human struggle. Yes. Which is of characters living and growing up with an identity and with even a psychological development and everything that, that we go through. If we, um, it's not anesthetize, was if we sanitize that, then what work are we doing? <laughs> you know, uh, you, what, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. I mean, I definitely, right. so definitely what you've chosen to do here has been done. Like, yeah. to me, to me, what happens is that, you know, Pogo and Gogo, -Go, they actually come with some baggage, because they rhyme, yeah, of course. because they, because they, they have this sort of, um, like comic book or comic or they're they're meant to be sort of like you know sort of every man you know sort of thing i get i get all of those things um they they're sort of uh taken away from the complexity of human experience um that has definitely been done i just i i, I think it's just interesting but of course, and then I guess I'm also saying that the baggage is still there, right? It's just a different yes, kind of baggage. Yes, absolutely. And they so. do have their individuality, right? Uh, because when we uh, read this, we know that Pogo reacts in a particular manner. He's not bothered about the bigger things that are happening. He's, he's only focused on the uh, things in his immediate world, his family and all that. Whereas the other chap, he's, he's, he's pro it hints at probably a, a little bit of a... a, a I don't know, elitist kind of an upbringing where he has the luxury not to think about the problems of everyday life, but he can think about the larger problems. Is this the right cause? Are we fighting for the right cause? So he's he's he has luxury to do that. Whereas this other guy, Gogo, he doesn't have the luxury to do that. So it it does bring out the individuality in a put in a manner. Uh, but what I have tried to do is, is I have tried to sanitize these two characters from any of the reader's own biases coming in. Of course, I'm sure still there could be, but to the extent possible, I have tried to do that by simply giving him giving them the very generic names. We don't even know what country this is happening. Probably this is a nation country, going by the uh, the uh, way they use the words and the local language, but we don't know who these two people are. They are they, are, they could be anybody. Well, there's a lot of fascinating material to work with. I think this is actually where where things become so interesting about how we write and communicate with you know our audience. Like you say, our audience has you know suppositions, and the fact is we're always working with those, right? Because our audience are human beings who who have developed identity in this sort of um, cultural story that we that has been told to us and that we continue to tell. Um, and, and so we see things in terms of stereotype and, and all of those things. Well, it's interesting. You're, you're, I think you're, you're looking at the right issues, you know? Um, okay. And you might even be, you might even be suggesting some of them. I mean, I could even see if this piece went on that it might be interesting if they became more identified, right? You know, they okay. start out sort of because one thing you want to do in any of your works is you want to move through something. Right. So if you if you do pursue it, it might be interesting if they become more identified with their with their kind of specifics. Um, right. One way people will do this is they'll write, you know, they'll have soldier one, soldier two. I mean, there's a number of ways to do that sort of generic yeah. thing there. There are things I think we want to think about, you know, our characters, our characters are, we, I want to say like, it is removed from the piece, but I've said many times that basically we're dealing on two levels, the specific and the individual, which is important, and the universal. The effect of our work is that the reader is able to identify the specific person let's say the specific character as not them. 
right? That's what happens when you identify them specifically. Because if they, if I identify yeah. this person as a representative of me and I feel like it's me, then, then suddenly I'm involved in the work in a different way that's True. not as safe for me. And what happens if I'm involved mm. in the work and it's not as safe for me is I will psychologically distance myself from the work. Right. Interestingly enough, right? But if it's not me, I can invest in it. I'm like, okay, this is not me. I'm not from there. I'm not blah, 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 blah. So I can go ahead and I can actually attach and have their experience. But they're also universal. If, so in a sense, they're specific, but they also serve a role. Right. Right. And, and our characters serve different roles. We have a character that serves the role of protagonist. We have a collection of characters that serve, you know, the role of, let's say, authority figure or, or sibling rival, you know, and I, by sibling rival, I don't mean that they have to be a sibling, but rival yeah. or the role of lover, you know, uh, the role of, you know, uh, sage, uh, elder or something like that. So they're both. So every person that we represent is both they're an individual and playing a role. Yeah. Do we want to take that away from ourselves? Do we want to take that away from ourselves? I don't know. Um, OK, it's, let me let me it's, just it's say interesting. Couple... it's interesting that you should you mentioned that uh, there are other ways of doing this soldier one, soldier two. I actually considered calling them sergeant and private. But then I realized that sergeant and private are labels. They are not real people. And, uh, whereas and by giving them a name, where, uh, so, and there is also a power dynamic because you know that a sergeant is, is, is the superior, he's the senior, and a private is a junior. So there's a power dynamic over there. And it's a label. Soldier one, soldier two is a transcript. I wanted these two characters to be people. And the only way to do that, I thought, was to give them names. And I, had to, yeah. I wanted to give them names. Yeah. Which which will not indicate anything, so that my condition doesn't kick in. So that's why this came up. And and in a way, by keeping them keeping the name simple, I'm also stripping away. It was an attempt to strip away from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, seriousness of the situation. Okay. Well, you'll make your you'll make your choices, Ram. Let me just say a couple other things. I I really like the use. So I. And this is actually just something in general. We're, ha we're having this conversation, but in general, with this group as, as a whole, I want to say that I really enjoy when you all write from your, spec your specific experiences more so, because those details are... So Ezra Pound says, make it new. You know, I can read... I didn't actually grow up in suburbia, but let's say, you know, I can read a bunch of stories about suburban America and it can be okay, but it's not nearly as interesting as me, for me as reading about something that takes place in Mumbai, okay, for me. I mean, that's just personal. I mean, there might be a lot of, you know, maybe there's a lot of suburban Americans who just want to endlessly read about suburban Americans. I believe that's true. I don't believe they're going to literature that much, whatever. I think, you know, remember the, the the things that you know so well, they really are a gift too. They're not something to be shunned. Um, so that that's just a that's just a personal thing. So I would just keep that in mind. And so in that vein, I really like the use of foreign language in this. I personally like foreign language use a lot. I like that specificity. It makes these characters much more interesting to me. It makes my reading experience much more interesting. And it starts to do that thing that. That, that I enjoy. I'm like, okay, these people are not me. Good, great. I want to read about people who are not me, but I want to walk in the shoes of people who are not me. I don't need to walk in my own shoes. I've walked in them already. I'm tired of them. You know, that's what I'm saying when I involve myself in the work. I'm coming to do something else. And so I do like that very much. And I think you handle it very well. I, I read the foreign language and don't really feel stopped by it at all. I feel, you know, that I'm enjoying it. I'm also noticing it as a trend. Um, it seems to me in the various shows that I watch, you know, the movies and stuff that there's much more use and much more understanding of the individuality of language. People are using their own languages. Not everyone, you know, 
I'm watching in the US. Not everyone on the screen is magically speaking English all the time. It's dealing with the reality of we have we have different languages. And not only do we have different languages, that means that we also have different ways of perceiving the world through our languages. Mm -hmm. So I like that. And I like that you do it here. I do. I, I was I was touched by what you're saying. You know, I think you make the comment about, you know, he wants to sell, you know, will we get new boots, you know, because he'll sell them. And I think you're I think you make that point in this. I mean, I like that sort of economic point. I think you make it very strongly and it's well juxtaposed with that sort of um, the Supreme Leader statement. And then this sort of like we drive down into just small things and you see in a way both the cheapness of their lives in a way which are going to perhaps be sacrificed, but also the importance of those little things. You know, so it does both simultaneously. I think that that's nice. And um, yeah, I think all of this is good. If you do pursue this, you can't just stay with that. So you can't just keep making that same point. You're gonna have to go further. So yes. you've made that point. Now we have to develop the text. Interestingly enough, you say, you know, Sergeant and Private, that that's a hierarchy, right? So that's going to be built in. If you said man and woman, there would be a hierarchy there that's cultural, right? It's very hard to avoid all of that. You've created two people that yes, they're sort of like uh, they're they're equals. Um, but I think it would now be it, it, it could be interesting to explore their differences, you have to see where you're going to go. But anyway, I, I like this experiment. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rashma, let's uh, talk about uh, your article. We'll check in with you. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a little bit like heady, right? I get it. It was like a little bit uh, elevated um, conversation. I think we just, you know, when it comes to this stuff, I, I like I said, my daughter's 13 and she's going to be in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and play, you know, some small role. And, and I'm trying to get her to watch the movie, you know, of, you know, Shakespeare. And I'm saying to her, like, she's not going to understand all of it. And quite honestly, I think that the, the comedies of Shakespeare are a little overrated. But that's just me. I, but she's not going to get all of it. And, and even in this conversation, I, we're never going to get all of everything. So just just take it in, let it, you know, we're like fallow fields, right? We're just we're just trying to you know, ready ourselves for, you know, our, our creative growth. I'm sorry that right. I don't know if that worked or not. But um, Rashma, tell me a little bit about what this piece is. I guess I'm preparing you because this is also going to be a little bit heady. Right. So I've, I've kind of uh, used this time because we, we weren't able to put on shows to read and, uh, you know, from in Sanskrit poetics to to our thought to others. And I have kind of was invited to write this article and I thought, what is this new thing that we can bring in? That is one thing. And second thing was, I watched Mahabharat by Peter Brook. And I'm, I do like, uh, I'm not really into Indic uh, uh, and epics otherwise, but when I saw uh, what uh, Peter Brooks had done with Mahabharat, it kind of was an eye-opening thing. It was, it was just very fascinating to see how he made the familiar strange and how he could use the uh, elements of fantasy and, and magic and make it even more theatrical. So I kind of thought that, he, and then I was reading about rituals through uh, in Campbell's book. So I'm kind of, there's a lot of ideas going there and uh, I'm just trying to put out a, 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 an argument. I think that if we br want to, there's something called plasticity of language and plasticity of stage, which Paula Volga, I think she's an American playwright, she talks about that we, in, in going for realism, we're missing that out. What we are missing out is that the stage can be used to create so many spaces. And if we put a sofa and we put, uh, create rooms, we've just taking it away from that, you know? And the plasticity of language is when we can bring in the outer world with our language, if we can spin it in. Uh, these days, there's this whole thing about trying to sound more like cinema, more like OTT show on stage which is going against us. We cannot look like them because it's, it's not possible. We have to use what we were made for, what, what, how theater originated and what it gave. And 
so that's what I thought. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and, and, uh, you're writing this piece for, um, an online journal. Yeah. It's basically a peer journal. This is for stage theater people, stage buzz. So mm -hmm. mostly they come. So, so, um, this is my, my, my overall thing basically comes as a writer. So I, I, I write in a lot of different forms and you know, right. I publish in poetry and, and fiction and essay. And, and of course I, I write a lot of essays and I, um, basically what you have is you have a problem of, of complexity, right? So you, 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 you wish to say something and, and I think when we come into it as a, I, I, this is how I use writing. I personally, I come into writing. I don't know exactly what I want to say, right? right. right? I, I don't know the answer. You know, the, the typical way that we talk about an essay is that we're going to have a thesis statement and right. the way I learned it is like, you know, have a thesis statement. And then I don't know that we have a lot of trouble actually teaching writing, particularly to, to people who are young because people who are young are impatient and they want to just get the work done so that they can go out and play, which is what, you know, we're meant to do basically. So, so how do you get them to write these essays? And so there's a lot of weird ways that we do it, but it seems to me that if we want to say something, we, we want to write something that advances the conversation. That's the, that's the main thing. So the conversation is already at a certain place and we want to take it somewhere further, or we want to take concepts that are maybe understood by, you know, a small group and bring them out to a new audience. So no matter what we're doing, we're going to do something new. We're either right. going to, you know, for this audience, we're going to take this audience someplace new that they haven't been before, or we're going to add our voice to the conversation, you know, something like that, or we're going to bring the, these ideas that this group has, and we're going to transfer them to another audience and expand right. the audience, both things. And actually you can do both, which means that you have something that's a breakout. So right. that means you're, you're handling, basically communicating to this audience that understands your, your essential concepts and understands your platform. You're communicating to them something new. So you're elevating their understanding, but you're doing it in such a way that the lay person can also understand it. I'll use lay right. person as anyone that's outside of the group. Right. So, so it basically works for both. Um, that's actually an ideal situation because that's that's what we actually want with our work we want to <clears throat> we but it's not absolutely necessary you know it's sort of like writing an academic piece versus you know being malcolm gladwell right yeah. <laughs> you know right we can write an academic piece where malcolm gladwell is so skilled is that he takes basically ideas that people are writing about in academic journals. And then he writes a popular book that sells, you know, multi-million dollar copies. So, um, and then the academics are all like, well, that, he doesn't even understand the concepts, you know, but um. anyway. Um, so we have something complex and I don't know what, you know, I, I can, there are two ways that I kind of simultaneously go with this. I kind of, you know, want to see your argument and then I want to make my own argument. Right. Um, but the better me, <laughs> the better me should be like, how can I help you make your best argument? Right. Um, and for me, I use, I use writing and basically a kind of system of writing as a, as a tool to help me get to what it is that I want to express that I don't know, basically. I, I wanna keep it in my mind that I don't know. The one thing with writing, if I'm writing an essay, and this is actually true of our fiction writing and everything else, I think that my first response to something is probably my worst response. It's my most cliched, right? It's my most, like, if I can think it before I've even written the piece, then it probably isn't new. I mean, I'm no genius. I got to admit, right. you know, I, I'm far from a genius. I am a, I'm a technician who uses written words to do things with. I am nothing without my technology. If I did not have a computer and, you know, the skill of typing, I'd be nothing, you know, honestly. So, 
So let me let me just what I what I would do is work with the forms that we're already very familiar with. So what happens here, and I can sort of feel it, is that in this first paragraph, you you kind of go down like a rabbit into a hole. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. definitely good for ex exploration. But it isn't really the kind of machine that we can create to take us someplace else. Because what we do is we just go through, we follow that rabbit, you know, <clears throat> I think the the phrase is chasing rabbits actually and i think there's some songs that evoke that so we end up just chasing rabbits and in the end at the end of the essay and i i do this too we've chased a lot of rabbits it can be very very productive i think that that's the writing that i did for for a very long period of time and actually it's probably still the writing i do and then i take all that rabbit chasing and i go okay how do i organize it so that it actually um, takes someone on a journey and moves them in a patterned way so that they can arrive at this new space that I want them to arrive at. Okay. So I think here we have, you know, some of the chasing rabbits that is drawing upon some of the things that you want to uh, talk about. What I think it needs is probably to to try and um, I want to say inflict inflict this organization onto it, which I think it's so funny. I think we as writers we resist it because you know the reason the reason I think I'm a good writer and not a hack is because I've always resisted this regimentation of like form. I hate form. I love chasing rabbits. It's because I love chasing rabbits that I'm a good writer, because that's where the real creative energy comes from. I'm not afraid to go in all these different directions and gather all these different things. I'm not afraid to chase them. So I guess I'm, I'm anticipating, you know, we writers when we're because we're so exploratory, we also resist the rigidity sometimes of these presentations. But I've come to over a long period of time recognizing why they're important. So the first is basically it's a, an issue of organization. The in an essay form, the way we usually want to organize is we want to contextualize our argument first. Without the contextualization, we don't have any basis to explore. It might be similar to I've written in many people's you know fiction pieces established point of view right okay the contextualization is like that it's like establishing the point of view and so i think you know you want to use this beginning section to help the reader if they don't know and we have to assume that they don't or if they're your your specialized audience that they're you're refamiliarizing them with the context that you want to establish because context can change and basically the the value of our argument is always in response and in balance with the context that we develop so it seems to me that the way you start this is you really are talking about how theater remains relevant does that mm -hmm. seem fair uh yeah yeah so That is different than talking about theater as a, as a ritual, right? It's different than some of the things that you end up presenting because it can seem to me that it seems to me that you're talking about, you know, audiences prefer squid games, but it's like, it's basically like, to me, it's like talking about the sort of the physical nature of theater. Like you're talking about actors getting together on a stage, um, you know, and and performing for an audience that's localized, as opposed to what we have with the proliferation of our technology, um, you know, Squid Game, which I haven't seen, but but also, I mean, my daughters do TikTok, you know, unfortunately, and you know, uh, texting and all the ways that we communicate to each other. I mean, theater is a communication device, right? 
as is all of these other things. So in this world that has all these other technologies where people can have this kind of communication, how does theater remain relevant in that world? And does it remain relevant in the form that it's that it remains in? I, this, maybe that's a further question. Um, so if that's where you're going, I think that probably that's what you have to deal with in terms of the context. The contextualization has to be an examination of the, the current state of really what we're talking about is storytelling, right? I mean, that's to me, that's what we're talking about. So the current state of storytelling, which is a form of communication, it happens to be a very effective form of communication, um, exists in theater and it exists in all of these technologies. How does theater compete with those other technologies? Is that the, is that the issue? Uh, that, that's the starting point. What I'm saying is that uh, in trying to be like more and more like them, oh, and uh, A, it is an unfair comparison because uh, theater is a ritual. Uh, Being is closer to a ritual than to just a performance on stage, just a story on stage. It's more, it's more than that, it's, it's different. So, so the comparison is kind of wrong. Uh, so I'm kind of, yeah, so I'm going against the grain by saying that. Well, well, so, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't get to your question of like, how do you compete, right? Yeah. So, right, so the issue is how do you compete to say, you know, we shouldn't be making this argument it's sort of to, to, it's kind of a non-starter then, right? Because, I mean, I think the experience is that it's gonna, it's gonna be more and more difficult to, you know, keep theater relevant. And so, I mean, I think you're making an interesting point. It's definitely, it seems to me definitely the case from my reading that theater arrives at, arrives out of ritual. You know, first okay. there was, you know, there was some kind of human communities and then they were having religious rituals. Um, and then those religious rituals turned into sort of dramatic rituals dramatic, right. that, right, which were sort of kind of more complex stories right. that still emphasized core cultural values. Um, uh, we have kind of history of uh, uh, this, the g history of Genesis of theater is available for Greek, for ancient Indian theater. So, yeah, so there is, it's pretty clear that it started, it used elements of ritual uh, to, to create that performance, to create that effect. And in becoming more realist and become bringing all the sofas and everything, uh, we are, we'll not be able to kind of tap into the real potential of theater is what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a, again, like the ideas are complex and I, I mean, I don't have them and I don't have your ideas. And and in some sense, I would probably argue that you don't have them completely either. So the, the, the issue of we have these various things going on in our head, how do we uh, basically make Rich. them materialize on the page? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have perfect answers for it, but I know that they work basically together. So the two things that work together here are contextualizing the issue. Right. And mm -hmm. then uh, providing the thesis, which is basically the thing that you're going to say. Right. You know, what's what's your sort of how are you pushing this argument? You know, are you pushing the argument of, you know, we should not we should understand that there's a difference between, you know, these sort of mass marketed things and right. what theater should be. And right. we shouldn't be competing in the same venues. Right. Um, right if that's what you want to say, or, you know, to me, I think some of the issues are sort of economic, right? You know, it's like, right. you can watch, you can see, you know, the issue of technology is that you can subscribe to something or watch TikToks, I guess, for free, you right. know, or YouTube for nothing. And, and theater demands that audiences come and pay and, mm -hmm. and you have a whole bunch of people who are working. I, right. you know, how do you, you know, what's the economics of it? You know, it seems like one of the one of the difficulties and the other thing, 
like theater, even if you bring it to an amphitheater, you're, you're still only, you're, you're just affecting such a small community because what we have are global communications, right? You can potentially reach billions of people right. and anything that we do locally is sort of, uh, you know, our plat, it's a, it's an issue of platform, right? It's a platform issue. Um, but so I don't really know, but I, but I know that you should set up, set up a clear and not really, you should set up the context, which is sort of basically the problem, right? As clearly as possible without actually coming up with your answer, because they're really too, okay. when, when we, when we create a context with our answer in mind, then we uh -huh. probably are not creating the context clearly enough. We're, right. we're, we're, we're bending it. We're creating a straw man. Right. right. It's a straw man context for our, you know, our victory lap uh, thesis statement. Instead, we want to try and really examine the problem and with, with an open mind. So what are the problems? The problems are, you know, modern technology allows access to billions of people. Uh, it's free, <laughs> you know, or it's seemingly free. It isn't finally free. It's 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 free because when you access billions of people, you get advertising revenue advertising, from a million yeah. of them yeah. and that's enough, right? The cost, the cost of the platform is, is very little. Whereas the amount of reach of the platform is very great. You know, if you, if you manage to market it and that might be part of the, part of the issue, you know, I mean, I think when I, when I read this, I think about all I read about guerrilla theater you know, that's taking place in smaller communities and all those drives. I, I read um, a magazine that comes out of South Africa where, where they just in the last couple of months, they had an article about some guerrilla theater in a small, you know, shantytown community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's called The Frame is the name of that article. But I, I, I love reading about yeah, I mean, it's just it's a quite a good magazine and gives you insight into what people are doing in different places, you know, um, you know, we can think right. of the theater, what the theater became, right, is, you know, the theater, you know, it's right. these ornate, expensive, aristocratic right. environments, I mean, really for the hoi polloi. Right, not not, not the people. I mean, with maybe Shakespeare being the exception, but then it really changed, you know, um, it was an interesting time. So, so yes, I would say you want to develop the context clearly without a sense of what your argument is going to be first, and then you want to come up with your thesis statement. Then basically, depending on what your thesis statement is, so uh, here you can do there's really kind of a choice you can either say, you can either if, the, if it's a short essay it kind of does work in threes okay this is what we're used to and i know people will be like oh my god the five paragraph essay you know damn you but there's a reason why that's come to be the kind of cliche form and it's because it has a rhythm that we expect for us as human beings it's been so widely shared it could be a different rhythm, but, you know, and, and maybe there's, maybe there's a kind of essay form in Indian literature that's different than the five paragraph essay, which is kind of a, maybe a Western rhythm and form, just like, you know, we have what the, you know, the, the Western musical scales. And I know that Indian, Indian, Indian music has different scales. So that's very possible. And it really might depend on your audience, how you want to do it. I, I, I love. I personally, for me, like I say, I like the unique aspect that that, you know, this group brings to my life. So I liked when you were treating uh, Indian uh, theater more than Greek theater, which I'm much more familiar with. And right. I can feel like and, and to me, I, I don't like the sort of oppression, colonialism of Western culture. You know, I, I want to discover something new. I, I know Western culture. I want something new. So I did like that lean a little bit more in your work but maybe there's advantages to developing the two of them. But basically what I'm going to get to is structurally, 
you would have this con this context ending with your thesis. So it's basically like, this is our argument. This is what we have. And this is what I'm going to say. And then you have a choice of either you're going to develop essentially three things. And it's either three different arguments or it's going to be the same argument three times, but going more deeply each time. Okay. That's kind of what we got going for us, you know, in terms of the rhythm and structures of these things. When we're making, when we're trying to make a kind of thesis driven argument. Um, right. And then in those, those, that's basically, we talk about that as being the body. And as unfortunate as it is, we try and write a topic sentence Basically, this is what we all learn. And then we have we have an example that we develop. So now we have something grounding. It's not just um, our ideas. We're talking about actual things. You know, this example, it can be a book. It can be this uh, play. It can be this performance. It can be this dot, 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 dot. And we basically do that. And we and the examples, we consider that um, Basically, it's the legwork. It's not always what we want to do as writers, right? We love chasing rabbits. We don't always like doing the legwork of like having examples that support our ideas. Um, and, uh, and then basically you come back to it. You basically come back to your argument at the end. And what I notice in most thesis driven arguments is they're not definitive. We don't, we don't win the day with our argument what we're doing is we're contributing to uh, a set of ideas. My, um, my simple way of developing a thesis works like this. This is my reduction of a thesis statement. The context is also this part. You think this, you're wrong this right so it's sort of like you think theater is irrelevant because we have TikTok, squid games blah 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 you're wrong it is relevant because we need it for that blah 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 right so it's a simple way of developing that argument it's basically you create an antagonistic force and then you then you the thesis statement is the protagonistic force right and then as you go through your argument, you basically need to respond to both the antagonistic force and your protagonistic force. Okay. But um, I, to me, it's a, it's a fascinating problem that you're, that you're investigating. And, right. and you have to, you have to understand too, that you have, you have the problem of like, you may wish to argue for theater's survival. Right. Because, because we want to argue for the survival, you know, right. like, but, but that's not, you know, so that might be something that you need to recognize. Maybe theater itself has to change, um, hmm. find ways to evolve so that it can survive. That might be one of the things that you have to, you have to recognize. It's not just when, even though we, we start off like, we set the context and we say, you think this, you're wrong, it's this. At uh -huh. the end, the at the end, our antagonist is not completely wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't be. If they were completely wrong, then this is a straw man argument and we don't have straw man arguments. So even though you might present it like that in, at, the, at the beginning in order to sort of get the juices going, at the end, you have to recognize that the way things are going, require a compromise on both sides mm -hmm. but but it seems to me you're you're leaning towards theater you know has a kind of it has a sacred ground right. that it should see as being you know right. maybe protective of and it and and you have to figure out a way Right. It's, it's something that it's, it's kind of the, the, the real power of the core of theater, which we've kind of drifted away from. And unless you come back to that, uh, where we use the uh, where it was uh, had some elements which are closer to, uh, I don't know, ritual or whatever it was. If you, because Peter Brooks has done it fantastic in Mahabharata. I know Ash, Abhinav is telling me I've taken a lot of time here. So, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> 
No, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it it's it's uh it it's very interesting. Yes, we did. We took a we took a lot of time, but it's it's very interesting to consider. I like um, you know, we as artists. I mean, I feel this way as a as a novelist. You know, so you know, I'm going to write a book. Who the hell looks at a book? You know, right. I'm competing with TikTok. I'm competing with YouTube. I'm competing with everybody. Right. You know, because I'm competing with them for their time. But I like, I, I, you know, one of the things that I glean out of this and, and made me feel, you know, jealous in the way you're writing about it is that it, it's also a, it's a community event. That's what ritual is. Ritual right. is a community event. Ritual right. binds a community. Right. Mm -hmm. It binds a community in various ways. And I and I see, you know, you're talking about again as a novelist, I do that all by myself, you know, in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Right. But I but but you're talking about all these other all of these people working together for a single purpose. Right. right? That will end up including the audience in sort of the realization. In the, in the, in the space and the real time, which other forms cannot. And apart from that, if we add the, for instance, I saw in Singapore, you know, this uh, uh, a fire dance with three people just dancing with fire. And it was like nerve wracking. If for a second something goes wrong, they would be up in flames right in front of your eyes. So that the power of that immediate is so much more than watching it on, you know, uh, even a man on fire in on TV or on uh, yeah, right. mobile screen. Yeah, that's what I, uh, would argue for is right 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 well um try and just try and bring you know take all this you know the chasing the rabbits and then try and bring it into some form okay you know? and unfortunately what happens is the big thing that we you know we have this sort of platonic ideal of all we want to say and how we want to transform the entire world and we find that once we actually type it out it ends <laughs> up just being shadows on the cave walls right so we can only do so much at the end of the day with what we actually produce, but um, and and we have to be comfortable with that. But uh, but I, I I'm interested in what you come up with. I hope that you will take a look at some of that guerrilla theater. I think that that I, is, I'll, I'll do that. I made a note. I'll I'll, I'll yeah, look at that, and I am kind of yeah. That's uh, going that's going in a really great direction, and it talks about. I mean, I think there's something to talk about in terms of art. And, and our production of art, where it's an issue of platform. You know, it's like, okay, so the powers that be, the tech companies, they have these platforms and they create their algorithms and they have their, they can produce all these, uh, this material. It's like, okay, and we're here and we can't do that. Right. So what do we do? You know, I was just thinking about, um, you know, like, let's say we talk about publishing, you know, in the United States. Okay, so we had all these books up here, you know, what. Well, are, you know, the, in the U.S., the underclass, the the uh, you know the African American community, they played the blues, right? Right. That's storytelling. That's storytelling, right? They could have just said, "My life is miserable, and I feel really oppressed and unhappy," right? So now they're just standing on a street corner saying that to nobody. So they they gather the platform of, "Well, I'm playing the guitar, and it sounds good, and now I'm singing to you about how how oppressed my life is." Right. That's storytelling. That's storytelling of people who are not allowed the platform of publishing in in New York City. They were not able to publish their novels in New York City from the Delta. So they had a guitar or whatever they had yeah. and they sang their songs. That's right. that's guerrilla art, you know. Right. So right. I, I have nothing but respect for it. I mean, we're right. scrappy. We're scrappy. Okay. Um, great. Well, we better, let's see. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rashma. I, I love, I, I love taking this stuff on. It's important to take on. Right. Um, because, because right then <clears throat> without it, then all we're going to have is the voice of, you know, it's not the voice of individuals through TikTok. It's the voice of the algorithm that we have. So right. do we want to have the voice of the algorithm? Or do we want to have something else? It's, right. it's the same. It's a, it's like, it's all the plays coming out of New York. It's all the uh, literature coming out of New York City. That's going to dominate the world. Okay. Now it's the algorithms coming out of Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Well, what about, what about all of us? 
you know, where it just comes down to us and it's, you know, influences us. How do we fight back against that? Right. Right. I will come on. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Sri Tran. <clears throat> Uh, what is, uh, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, let's uh, look at that. That's um, let's have you read a little bit of this. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, so one of the things that I, I want you to read some of this part, you know, with this interaction between uh, this mm -hmm. uh, boy and this girl in this, but one of the things that's so great about this piece is this environment that you've that you've come up with. And so I'm going to have some questions about this environment, but I'll just describe it seems to be like all, all we really know about this environment right now is that this um, this boy, 16 or so, he is traveling somewhere. He's been told by his father to travel between the river and the forest. The forest has demons. Um, maybe there's some, you know, the, the Maybe there's some issues with the river too. Um, and it, it seems to be flooded somewhat yeah. and he's going along and there's the, this tavern and maybe even a larger community that, that are up in the trees. And I don't know if that has any historical relevance. It may easily because it may be people who want to live by the river, but they don't want their homes to be flooded. So yes, that yes. it might have a real historical base. I don't know. To me, it's kind of a magical uh, place. And to get up into the trees at this tavern that's that's in the trees, you you can either take a ride up a up some kind of thing, or you can climb yourself, and then you don't have to pay. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's 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 our little preamble. Uh, let's. Um, it's there's a lot that's so good here, but anyway, I'm gonna. Can you see that yellow line? Maybe we'll just read to that spot. And uh... yeah, sure. Okay. 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 Four presents for the basket. None if you use your hands and feet. I feed them. The tree was not too difficult to climb for a grown man of sixteen, but the chances to fall were high for too much grown. Okay, too much grown-ups. The wood was treacherous with slippery black marks above posing as footholds. There were low branches brushing against each other and the leaves jutting out of the curled up with water from a recent rain. Monkeys hung from the upper branches, threatening to touch the sky. A fruit or rock fell upon him now and then as he struggled to hold on to the branches. Within a foot above him were the brown rails as the, girl pull, as the pull girl gave him her hand. Thanks, he said. My help cost a crescent. The girl held her hand to him, her eyes staring into his without guilt. Pushan drew his hand back, but he found himself on the deck. You are stealing me, he protested. <laughs> a crescent or you can go back down, the girl said as she spread her hands out as if to stop him from barging inside. The woman was passing below the tree and looked up at the commotion above as another joined her. Fine, take it. He snorted and threw the blue crescent at her. She caught it in her hand and rubbed it as she nodded her head. Welcome to Harker. Her phone vanished as easily as a blink and a smile curved her on her lips. Go inside. Pushan did not return the smile. His crescent would have made him happier than her courtesies. He walked past her across the table set on the deck outside the main tavern. Up from here, the harker looked larger than from below. It rested on a tangle of gigantic branches of five trees. The roof slanted to either slide from the center. The door faced south, and the huge windows due east and west were only hidden by brown curtains from inside. Apparently, no one cared for the heat of sun in this place. OK, great. Uh, um, what um, so I am I am curious about uh, about this location is it is it a kind of is it a what do you think of it is it a fantasy uh, location or is it a historical location uh, it is a fantasy location definitely it is isn't. I mean, it does not exist on Earth anywhere, at least. And and what as far as I know. And and what time period are you thinking of? Uh, sort of medieval India. Um, okay. Maybe 
in between 700 and 1000 let's see something like that and is it is this coming from like in terms of your imagination of this place is it coming from something you've seen or you're sort of drawing upon something i mean we're always drawing uh, upon things yeah i'm drawing upon something like i'm making a map and putting forests here and there like, is it uh, it is like, something uh, inspired from amazon rainforest uh, uh-huh yeah. but it's a medieval india and are you seeing are you seeing are what are you envisioning for the story? Is it a longer story? Is it a quest? Uh, type it's story? not a longer story. I mean, I'm writing uh, short stories for my world. So uh, it is one of the short stories. And uh, this is actually not what I thought. Uh, in a website, I saw a post uh, claiming as a competition for some tavern. I mean, I mean to describe the tavern in my world. That is the competition. So I thought I'd participate in it. So I wrote this one. Okay. Well, I like their direction because the fact that you spend time describing the tavern and inventing this tavern is just it's a it's a wonderful aspect of this story i mean i had not seen it you know i i perceive you know to some degree the sense of medievalness of this piece i mean i think that that could come across a little bit more i think i know you as an author and you know i know this group so i i, I make some assumptions and i think you could do more with that um perhaps but um but I think that this this world is interesting and I want to know what happens. I do not know what's at issue yet, of course, in this story. You know, this, a story is not about a location. It's about a character arc. Uh, so we have a character yeah. who comes in with a problem of some kind. Right. They seek to solve that problem. They do. They are not successful. And then they come out with something else, yeah. basically. So. The character arc is significant. The character arc has two elements. It has the external element. You know, I need to find the the goblet of everlasting life, as it usually is. You know, uh, immortality, as it always is, right? And then uh, the internal struggle. I need to feel a value to you know my father, as it usually is. You know, so um, we do we do need those things. I actually just have one. Um, Right. So I, I, I see the emphasis on the tavern. I, I love the invention here. It seems very cinematic to me. I, you know, I can see if I were if I were a director, I would want to shoot these scenes. I would like to invent this space. Um, it, it looks to me, to my eyes at reading it, it looks wonderful. Um, the this piece brings up um, really one principal issue mm -hmm. um, for me. I don't know what's real. Okay. <laughs> you know, and it's because I don't have any contrast. I don't have in these pages a sense of the point of view character and how they see things. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me give you let me give you an idea. So the tavern lay uh, sprawling in the thickest of the trees to the north. Those dark trees terrified Pushan as the tavern was tightly embraced in their branches, twisting around the wooden wall like lusting snakes. OK, there's a lot of personification there. Um, it was dark above him, not yet only a shade of purple to the west. He could walk ahead, but it would take a long before nightfall. And who knows what demons the forest brings at night. He might not want to leave the sky above, but the beasts inside might not share the same sense about the thick roof over him. So I think you're talking about the beasts inside the tavern, maybe at that point. Uh, but, I mean, inside the forest, like the way land was. Oh, still in the forest. OK. Uh, OK, so we want to just be more clear about that. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't have a sense of what, so you could say that the depiction here from the narrative point of view is something is magical, right? It's like a magical realism, right? We could say, um, but I don't know what Pushan's um, point of view is about it. Really, I don't know mm -hmm. if he has a different point of view about what he's seeing than the reality. 
I don't know any, I don't know whether the magical, the magical aspects of this environment are his or the narrator's. They seem to be the same. And what I want is for them to be separated so that I can see the place somehow. Does that make any sense? Like, I yeah, basically want, so he, he I... can either see it magically, he can see it magically, right? And then, but the narrator sees it objectively. Mm -hmm. So, and then I can identify through the narrator that this is a real world that really exists that he sees magically. And that identifies him as a character and identifies the world. Or it can be the other way around where he sees it. Maybe he's a person who's, he comes from his village but he's never seen a tavern up in the trees before. He's never seen, you know, these, you know, woods that are like this before, right? So he has some kind of reality and then hmm. the world has this sense of magic, right? Uh, okay, Does that let make me, any sense to you? Uh, yeah, let me restate it, like uh, as in how I understood it. So you mean to, so let's say these demons are in the forest. So, you want to know whether there are really demons in that forest or whether it is a superstition that Pushan believes. Okay, you is said it, it so much right? better than I did. Yes, that's one okay. way to think of it. Yes. And from that, I also then it colors everything else. I want to know whether, you know, this is whether this is a magical place and he's not magical or mm -hmm. whether he sees it as magical, but yeah. it's actually not. It's got to be, it sort of has to be one or the other, but right now I don't have any ground to stand on. Like, yeah. Okay. One way I could fix it maybe by describing how Pushan, I mean, maybe Pushan felt uh, like a sort of wonder seeing the trees in the tavern. Right. Well, you want, what you want to do is you want to basically differentiate between the narrative voice and Pushan's point of view. So, mm -hmm. If, if Pushan, you know, you could say, um, you could say the tavern uh, lay in the thickest of, in the thickest of trees to the north. I would actually start with the description of the tavern, okay. because that you know he's looking at the tavern. We might as well see the tavern, right? So, but um, the dark uh, the the woods terrified Pushan, um, but. He saw, but he saw that the tavern was embraced in the branches, like, you know, like lusting snakes. Like if he sees it that way, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Right now we understand it. This is his vision of it. But when we get it just, but the tavern was tightly embraced in their branches, twisting around the wooden walls, like lusting snakes. That's not what he thinks. That's the narrator. And so mm -hmm. I'm sort of like, the narrator is telling me that that's reality. The narrator reflects an objective reality. And so, but what we want to have is we want to have a contrast. We want to perceive two things, both the narrator's reality and the character's reality. That makes it complex for us. Otherwise, we don't have any ground to stand on, right? Because the, the world is actually made up of those two things. There is a reality that we all sort of agree on and we can agree on. We all see things the same way and we can make it however we want. We can make people float if we want, but we all see that people are actually floating, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have a person that has, you know, they have a subjective point of view. Basically, they have a point of view that's based on their experiences of the world. And we want to have both of those on the page. Okay. And, and okay. in this piece right now, we're missing the difference between the two of them. Okay. And it's it's largely because you don't really go into Pushan's point of view. You don't we, we don't we don't understand what his point of view is, how he sees things. We don't we don't have him say, you know, uh, I'd never, you know. I've never seen houses and trees before, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have that or, yeah. um, you know, or, we, and we don't have you, or we don't have him say, you know, his father told him to avoid the, 
the the woods because they were filled with demons. Pushan didn't really believe in demons, but he didn't think that he would test the theory today, right? You know, um, <laughs> it's like still it was dark, and who know who knows? Maybe his father was right. You know, <laughs> like right. I better not <laughs> take any risk. Yeah, right. We better not take the risk today. Mm -hmm. Some other day he would, you know. And now we have a sense of him and how he sees okay. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, got it. But that that I think I think that that's an issue. So you want to be able to sort of just tease mm -hmm. those two things apart so we perceive both of them. That is a good objective for this piece. If you can do that, then you'll understand a lot about having that sort of narrative view and Pushan's view. Mm -hmm. um, you, yeah, we want both. So then the reader knows where they stand. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's like um, sort of a differentiation, right? So that a reader need not directly connect with him, but at least he should have a sense of uh, reality. Right. Right. Exactly. We can identify one place or another. We can identify either, even if it's a magical space, we can identify with the reality of that magical space. Yeah. And then we can and we can identify with this person who does not know magic in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're like, OK, I identify with them because they don't know magic. But I also understand that this magic is real. Mm -hmm. Right. Or yeah. or oppositely, he sees everything as magical, but actually it's just a real world that I can understand. Mm -hmm. I can I can also identify with that. Right. Yeah. So you have to make a choice about it. And then yeah. that starts that that begins to develop that character. And then that character entering the tavern is so much more interesting because mm -hmm. we actually see a contrast. And it, it is it is the basis of story, right? We have a protagonist that is one way and they're basically pitted against the forces of antagonism, which is everything else in the world. It's other characters. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, this. It's this environment, it's the tavern, it's the innkeeper, it's the girl at the top, you know, who's great, you know. Um, I did have the, 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 was the crescent, is that a real monetary uh, no, uh, it's, thing it's, of it's, value? No, no, it's uh, made up. That's great. It's, you did a great job with it. So I, I love that invention. I completely understood it. It's really good. So that's my comment on this piece. Uh, I think it's a great start. Yeah, thanks, Artis. Uh, yeah, it got a sense of clarity to me as well. I thought something was amiss with this, and I knew no way. Yeah, I. But I think that that's just that's the little piece, and and working on that. I mean, you're obviously working on your skills as a writer, working on this skill of differentiating those two forces, basically of protagonism and antagonism, making them different, and making the reader. So we, you want the reader to perceive two things, not just one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. That's just a that's 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 like a flat line. We want to have this contrast because that's that's the action of the story. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Great yeah. start. Ashwani. I'm here. How Good are you? See you. I'm great. Nice and how are you? you? Thank you. I'm doing good. I'm the same uh, here. Forced to, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's talk about this story a little bit. Um, let's have you read. Um, I'm gonna. Do you see that line I just drew? So it's yes, there. yes, I do. Okay, yeah, let's read that beginning part. She remembered it too well, but did not reply, keeping her back towards him, hoping he would leave it at that and accept her silence as a polite refusal to attend the meeting. Lakshmapa persisted. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Ashwani, Ashwani, I'm sorry, my mistake. So, you know, no, start from the beginning and read down to that section. Okay. Does that show up? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Abaka awoke abruptly, inches away from her edge of the enormous bedstead, her back turned towards Lakshmapa. 
She turned to glance at him over her shoulder. He lay supine on his side of the bed, still asleep. The sight of the uncrumpled bed linen between them made her grimace. Had she turned fully, she could have reached out and touched him. But for now, the space between them seemed as wide as the Netravati flowing outside, swollen by the monsoon, her banks distended by her gushing waters. They had not spoken to each other for days, and the chasm appeared to be getting wider by the day. Their marriage, that of the Queen of Ullal and the King of Mangalore, had been hailed by the nobility as well as the populace of both kingdoms as perfect. And in the first few months, life had been blissful. But destiny had its own designs. Hundreds of miles away, King Manuel I, the ruler of a small kingdom called Portugal in Europe, whose territorial ambitions had long ago set into motion events that changed the course of Indian history and the fates of Ullal and Mangalore, two tiny kingdoms on the western coast of the Indian peninsula. She arose silently, intent on leaving the room before he awoke. But he called out to her even as she tiptoed out of the room. I hope you remember we have to meet the Portuguese delegation this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Ashwani. Um, so uh, is this a, this is a historical person that you're writing about? Yes, it is. But the Indian accounts about this queen are uh, uh, pretty vague and uh, they are not uh, documented properly. In fact, there are two queens, the, a mother and a daughter. Both of them have the same name and both of them the, have uh, similar records against the Portuguese colonism. So it's quite confusing. And I have been trying to get uh, some primary sources. Uh, I have managed about 10 or 12 so far, uh, you know, academic uh, articles uh, about the, what happened in that day, age. But uh, uh, regrettably, there's nothing written directly about Abaka. There, there are things written about how the trade was going on, what the Portuguese were doing, uh, how the other kingdoms were uh, managing, but there is nothing about Abaka. So I, I am writing a longish uh, thing about her, maybe a novella or a short novel. And this was just a part of it. That is why uh, your, uh, uh, I mean, my well-deserved criticism about uh, not really, uh, you know, describing what, how do the Portuguese come into the picture and uh, how do they fit into the story. But in the uh, total uh, picture, uh, the, the you know the full story, uh, all that thing falls into place. Okay. Um, well, my uh, my well deserved criticism is not really about the Portuguese. Okay, so the in this piece, what what I what I find is that there's a, there's a certain, it really, once you bring up the Portuguese, I feel like we're working through your agenda and we've left the character behind. Like, so it comes down, this is sort of like the, the large, the, the largest meta principle we have in our story is that a story is about the journey, essentially a journey of discovery of the protagonist. And that is the foundation of the story. And it feels as if, I mean, I can't say for sure, but it feels as if she's basically, I wanna say static. She's not starting someplace and going to arrive somewhere else. She's basically like a hero of this story. She's you know, against the Portuguese, and she's going to counsel to, you know, go to war against the Portuguese, and she's going to be right about it. And that, my friend, is what we call in the business a flat line. Like that, right? It doesn't matter how great she is, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter how great she is. She starts in one place and she ends in the same place. As far as our story is concerned, that's like A plus A equals A. And that's not what we want.
we want A plus B, which is the world of antagonism, creates a change in the character where they come somewhere else. They, basically, we, we deal with what's an arc of character, usually goes up, and then it goes down precipitously, and then it rises. So that's the arc of character. Um, or sometimes we call it the emotional roller coaster. But there's a sense of transition in terms of where they go. They start someplace, they, they rise, but then they meet an obstacle, and then they go precipitously downward, and they go down lower than they started. So they're not just going to the same place, and then they go into the, the valley of death, we can call it, or a psychological peril, whatever it is, where they have to make a choice either to continue going down, which might be noble, or to rise up and be transformed as the phoenix rising from the flames. So that's, you know, I think you're, you're at the stage of doing research. So um, the facts of the situation, but what you, but what we have to do is we have to think about the character. You know, when we start designing our story, we have to think about what is the character's issue? You know, what is it? What is the, what is the journey they're going to they're going to go on? And so if we look at this arc, it's basically it's driven by two things. One is we call the external struggle. So that's the that's a material thing that the character wants, like. Um, I was, you know, alluding to it with the, the Holy Grail, for example, from the Arthurian legends, right? You know, the cup of, you know, the chalice yes. that's going to grant immortality. Uh, Gilgamesh searches for the same thing, you know, etc. But it's a quest. Uh, Bonnie and Bonnie and Clyde wants money. You know, money is often the this external quest, you know, for the robber, etc. Uh, world domination. Is the, is the quest of, you know, the the autocrat of the moment, you know, whatever it is um, that they think if they have it, they're going to be safe and nothing bad can ever happen to them again. That's the external struggle. And then there's the internal struggle. It, the internal struggle is usually why are they so insecure? Right? Why, why do they need this chalice so badly? Why do they need world domination so badly? Why do they need to rob banks so badly? You know, what, what do they lack that, um, that inspires this incredible insecurity and all of this action, right? Which we can sort of understand. And then mm -hmm. what happens in the arc is that they don't end up achieving the external struggle but they often, this is a chiasmus model, right? So one, one is going, the external struggle is going like this, but the internal struggle is going like this, right? So they end up at the end of the story when they rise or they transform, they end up either understanding, they feel a sense of enlightenment, <clears throat> they come to the point where they, they achieve what they, what they really wanted internally. You know, the love of a parent uh, the ability to, you know, affect the community, to be useful, to whatever it might be, right? So to satisfy that internal struggle. So this, this discussion of character is basically the drive of story. And it's, and what happens for the reader, the reader wants to leave their life behind in which they're struggling also, and it's difficult, and they want to participate with your character on her struggle. When I participate with her, I'm both safe, but I also experience her peril and in a sense, metaphysically, arrive at her transformation also. And that's the core of story. Everything else is just window dressing, right? That's the human dimension. It's my heart being transposed, yank it out of my body and put it into her heart, into her body. And then I get to have these experiences. And that is uh, a very strong base. So I think you have, I, I love this environment and I love this uh, choice of character and, but 
you have to think about this. You, you have her begin here extremely strong and she doesn't have any place to go. Where does, where does she go from strength so that she can be transformed? You know? Um, yeah, go ahead, Ashwani. Uh, uh, I have a problem with writing this story. I have got a lot of material and I am uh, really fired up about writing about this character. My problem is uh, to create, and we know your uh, teachings very well about the uh, character arc. Uh, my problem is, should I give importance to the character arc and make the story readable? Or should I be faithful to the way history actually occurred? Um, well, you, you, uh, so I believe that the story is there. You just have not discovered it yet. The, it might not be found in your history books. It might have to be found. No, not here, <laughs> not here. <laughs> it has to be found in the heart. I believe there, there is no one on earth who, who doesn't experience the character arc, who's not challenged by these things. They don't always come to, they're not always, the worst case scenario is they're not driven down far enough that they actually have to create this sense of ascension, I think. You know, that's a, you know, maybe they do start out, they're doing well and they're, they're upper middle class and they don't really have any problems. There are a couple things and da, 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 da. And then they die, you know, they're still going to be confronted with mortality, which is the great confrontation of life, right? Mortality and, and making that passage. In a way, the story and the story arc, right? Going like this and arriving, it is, uh, Rashmo is bringing up ritual. All stories are ritual from my point of view, because all stories basically are a, a microcosm of life's struggle. Every story, because it begins here, it goes, we're challenged, and then we then we pass through the valley of death. It's kind of a ritual experience of the life experience, life and death experience that we all have. Um, I think the issue is for you to allow yourself to imagine the character struggle of this human being fully and not try to write or reproduce history, which is, from my point of view, it's another kind of fabrication. It's a fabrication, you know, it's like, it's this thing that absences the human struggle. And it's the human struggle that I think is the real history. So um, there, there's a, a funny thing. There, this little book here, uh, it's called uh, Do the Work. Um, but basically, he says, you can only, you can only uh, use three books for your research, then you have to write your book. So I think that's making the point that uh, the book isn't driven by research. It is driven by the heart and, and our understanding of the character. We can always get the details right. But I think you have a great start here. I think that if you feel driven to write about this character, that she seems a great character to write about, uh, what period in history is this? What's the dates? It's, it's uh, around between 1600 and 1660. Great, great time period. I love the specificity of it. I, uh, I like that it's, uh, it seems like, it does seem like it's a, a sort of a window of history. So, you know, a particular period. So I think that that makes it a very good project as opposed to British colonialism, which lasts much longer and, you know, carries on, you know, might be a little bit harder, but being able to have nice parameters is great. Um, you know, the if you're thinking about this in terms of a novel, 
the way I think is I don't try and come up with the answers, right? You have a time frame. You have certain events in there that you want to cover, right? That, that all seems great. But you, but one of the great building things that we want to do is we want to try and develop a sense of the character that we're dealing with at the beginning. So you're sort of writing the character as she is at maybe at the end. So maybe this is not where you want to start the story, right? But somewhere, you know that you have to have a change between the character in the beginning and the character at the end. So you have to figure out where the story gets told so that that takes place. Got um, it. But you want to know the protagonist. And another thing is you want to have a developed antagonist. Who's the antagonist? Who's the person that challenges or the, the circumstances that challenge her so that she is forced to change? Because characters do not change I think this is universally true, Ashwani, and you can answer. Yes. But the main thing that you can count on from everyone on Earth is that they do not want to change. <laughs> right. Um, so we only change when we have to, and that means that we have an antagonistic force that obligates us to change. And that means the antagonistic force isn't just evil, right? It means that they're also our teacher. Evil teacher, you know, I, I aspire to such place. So <laughs> I um, got it. Thank you. I'd work on it. Thank yeah. You. I mean, it seems like a, I, I really want to repeat. I really like the, the section of history that you're dealing with. I I would be interested to see who's like the, you know, I love a, a like an evil, you know, colonialist Portuguese character, you know, so maybe there's a character there that you want to develop and do some research on. Uh, maybe there's a, you know, a despicable envoy. I think I already know the actor who plays this person. <laughs> um, but uh, it, great, a, a great, uh, this is a great world. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Otis, for your very nice advice. And I'm sure I've, I'm, now I'm in the right direction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I try to steer you. I try to steer you wrong, Ashwani, but you, you, you'll write the ship, I'm sure. Um, so, well, what is? You. Do you yeah. have any? You don't have any pending pieces now, right? I, I don't think I do. Okay, never mind. Uh, I think uh, okay. So, Ram, you have raised your hand. Yeah, oh, there I is one piece that is pending. Uh, Otis, I think you had uh, sent me the feedback on that last week. Uh, so that is pending. I will, I will, I will send that to you. I'll send it to you with your feedback, so you don't have to hunt it out. Oh. This is the concluding part of the Sita story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Send that back to me. I'm sorry, Ram. I'll send it to you. No problem. Um, but yeah, no. I think I think that I'm up to date. I got a piece very early this morning, but I I, I wrote them back. I was not able to look at that. So, okay. So there are two pieces for next week, and my daughter said she uh, is going to send a piece to me uh, to forward to you. So, oh great, uh, that'll make it three. Okay. Um, well, and maybe uh, Madhavi is obviously do. Jay is here. Jay, I know, has been hankering to submit something. How are you, Jay? Uh, doing good, Otis. Uh, I've been uh, in and out of where I've been staying in due to everything that's been happening in this neighborhood. Uh, where, what neighborhood are you in? Uh, near Russia and Ukraine. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep your head down. Serpentine, serpentine. <laughs> Yeah, so I hope to submit something for next weekend. Okay, man. Okay, just okay. Keep your head down, Jay, please. I'll try to finish mine. Thanks, I've been Otis. Struggling with it for two weeks now. Okay, and so you'll get I'll in try and, Yeah, I'll try and finish it this week. Since two weeks, okay. words are just not coming on paper for me. Oh, I think that's called a writer's block. First time. We uh. I think I've quoted before Flannery O'Connor. She says, Flannery O'Connor says, every day I go and sit down at the typewriter because if something happens, I want to be there to see it. Yeah, I end up deleting whatever I write these days. 
<laughs> so I, it's taking forever for me to complete. <laughs> just sit down every day, every day, yeah. sit down. And eventually you drive yourself crazy just sitting there. Don't do anything else. Do not write any emails. You're not able to write emails. You're not able to check Facebook. You get it on TikTok or any of that stuff. Just sit there for a while and eventually you'll drive yourself so crazy. You'll just type anything. So I'm trying to I feel it. spiders in my head. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I look forward to that and uh, thank you all. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank you everyone. And we'll meet next Monday. Please keep the pieces coming in and I will share this, the link to this uh, Q and a once it's up on YouTube. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Abhinav. Thank you. Otis. Bye.